So here now a reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1, beginning with verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is God's own power for salvation to all who have faith in God, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. God's righteousness is being revealed in the gospel from faithfulness for faith. As it is written, the righteous person will live by faith. God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodly behavior and the injustice of human beings who silence the truth with injustice. This is because what is known about God should be plain to them because God made it plain to them. Ever since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, God's eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through the things God has made. So humans are without excuse. Although they knew God, they didn't honor God as God or thank Him. Instead, their reasoning became pointless and their foolish hearts were darkened. While they were claiming to be wise, they made fools of themselves. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images that look like mortal humans birds, animals, and reptiles. So God abandoned them to their heart's desires, which led to the moral corruption of degrading their own bodies with each other. They traded God's truth for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creation instead of... Can you believe that they took the word sin out of the dictionary? Since the English language is constantly evolving, dictionary editors frequently update their works to keep up with the vocabulary of modern speakers. In 2007, Oxford University Press removed dozens of words from their Oxford Junior Dictionary to make room for more modern terms. And evidently, the word sin did not make the cut. These kinds of stories lead some people to believe that we no longer take sin seriously, that the idea itself is antiquated. But I think that this is wrong. I think that people take sin very seriously in other people. <laughs> They just don't take it very seriously in themselves. Too often, we focus on the shortcomings of other people and exaggerate their wrongdoing. Hyper-aware of their immorality, we judge them harshly and demand justice. But when it comes to us, we tend to hide, ignore, and minimize what we like to call mistakes and when someone calls us out, we say, well, I'm only human, expecting people to forgive and forget. And Jesus understood this well when he said the following, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? You hypocrite, first, Take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Again, the problem is not that we don't take sin seriously. It's that we don't take it seriously in ourselves. But most of us know from experience that this is unwise. If we don't deal with our problems, our problems will deal with us. 
If we don't take sin seriously, life can quickly and unexpectedly unravel, breaking our hearts and destroying our most important relationships. One place that we see this clearly is in the first chapter of Romans, uh, where we read this morning. I wanna say from the start that it's okay if you're suspicious of this word, sin. It's been around for thousands of years, and over time, words can lose their power to effectively express human experience. In addition, this word is widely misunderstood and is sometimes used to hurt people. But I believe that when properly understood, it best describes the dynamics that drive human suffering. Words like failure or mistake tend to reduce the problem to bad decisions and individual actions. And while this is certainly part of what we mean by sin, it doesn't capture the full story. So what exactly is sin? According to the Bible, sin means to wander off the path or to miss the mark. And both of these images point to a turning away from God to something else. At the end of the day, most people just want to be safe and happy. Would you agree? We just want to be happy. We just want to be safe. And when we turn away from God to things of this world and insist that they give us happiness and security, we engage in a form of idolatry. Now, this might sound really weird because when we think of idolatry, we tend to think of people bowing down to things like golden calves. <laughs> and we see this kind of example in Romans 1, where Paul says that people, and I quote, exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. But this is only one example of idolatry. When we think more deeply, we see that idolatry is about ultimate concern. I want you to say that with me, ultimate concern. Say it one more time, ultimate concern. And the best way to surface our ultimate concern is to ask the question, what is the most important thing in my life? What do I put first? What has my ultimate allegiance? And if the answer to any of these questions is something other than God, then you are caught in the dynamics of idolatry. You are giving ultimate allegiance to something that is not ultimate thereby trading what is counterfeit for what is authentic. So we commit idolatry when we elevate anything in creation above the creator and expect it to do things for us that only God can do. Whether it's money, success, or power, your spouse, kids, or friends, drugs, alcohol, sex, travel, entertainment, or luxury, anything, somebody say anything, <laughs> anything in creation that takes precedence over your relationship with God is an idol. And when this happens, Paul says that all kinds of things start to go wrong. He says that our thinking becomes futile and our hearts are darkened. When we are faithful to God, we become wise because we're connected to the source of all wisdom. But when we turn away from God and are disconnected from the source of wisdom, we become foolish. Our thinking becomes futile. And we use the powers of reason not to do good, but to justify 
deny or hide our own sin. Self-deception is the name of the game. And as our minds are corrupted in this way, our desires follow suit. Instead of wanting what God wants and loving what God loves, we crave the very things that make us sick and destroy our lives. As our hearts are darkened, we pursue evil as if it is good, and we run away from good as if it is evil. So putting all of this together, we see that sin doesn't just lead to bad behavior. It's not just a mistake. It's not just a bad choice. It distorts and degrades our humanity and causes us to live in open rebellion against God. It is here that the real idol becomes visible as we glimpse a reflection of our own face in the mirror. Instead of saying, thy will be done, we boldly declare, my will be done. And Paul says that God gives us what we want, which is the freedom to keep doing what we're doing. Paul says that God gives us over to ourselves, which is to give us over to our sinful desires. So more and more, we crave things that harm us. We cling desperately to what destroys us, and we gleefully delight in what increases our suffering, even to the point of self-loathing. We become slaves, and life becomes a burden. The speed at which our life unravels is staggering, and we don't even realize the extent of our losses until looking back. And when we do look back, we not only see a series of bad actions, we see a life in ruins and we are powerless to do anything about it. Now, some of you may be thinking, I can't see myself in this story. As you listen to Paul describe the dynamics of sin, you may be thinking about all the good things that you've done that make you an exception. And maybe you're not entirely wrong. After all, Paul is not saying that every human being is so thoroughly corrupted that they are incapable of a single good deed. We can look around and see examples of bad people doing good things. Nor is Paul saying that every human life is devoid of joy and marked by self-hatred. Again, we can look around and see selfish people enjoying moments of happiness. Rather, Paul seems to be saying, if we don't take sin seriously in our own lives, things can quickly spin out of control. And the consequences for ourselves and our most important relationships can be devastating. He is saying, maybe you haven't reached the end of the road, but I assure you, this is where the road ends. I've counseled many people over the years as a pastor, but there's one story that sticks out as particularly tragic. And I've received permission uh, to tell this story and change the names uh, in order to protect the family's identity. Brennan came into my office a total mess. After five years of marriage, his wife Jade had kicked him out of the house and filed for divorce. Their first year of marriage seemed great, and it culminated in the birth of their daughter, Hope. But shortly after Hope was born, they began to argue about all kinds of things, especially money. You see, Jade was frugal. 
She wanted to develop a budget and stick to it so that, they, so that they could save money, especially now that they had a daughter. But Brennan, Brennan liked to enjoy the finer things in life. He could never find the time to develop a budget with his wife and to make things worse, he made all kinds of compulsive purchases. And you can see the pattern clearly. He spent, she discovered, both fought. Because the issues around money were never really solved, the couple began to drift apart and resent each other. Brennan eventually turned away from his wife toward a female friend at work. The friendship turned into an emotional affair, and the emotional affair turned into a physical affair, and Brennan was eventually caught. This ended his marriage, traumatized his daughter, and because it was with a subordinate coworker, it cost him his job. What started out as a small, solvable problem around budgeting spun out of control and ended in the obliteration of an entire family. It turns out that Paul was right. Friends, if we are going to be delivered from this insidious trajectory, then we must take sin seriously. Not just in other people, but more importantly, in ourselves. And once we do this, once we get honest, feel the weight of our problem and reach out for help, God is right there with a rescue plan. Paul describes this plan by pointing to Jesus. He says, as we read, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness, the faithfulness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And when Paul talks about the gospel, he's talking about the good news of God's salvation. The story of how God looked upon our suffering with eyes of compassion and gave his only begotten son to save us by his death and resurrection. This good news, this story, has the power to save us if we trust it. This is what faith and faithfulness are all about. Loyalty and trust demonstrated in faithful action. The gospel story shows us that Jesus was 100% faithful to God. And that shows us that God is 100% faithful to us. And the faithfulness of God that is revealed in the faithfulness of Jesus is intended to elicit faithfulness in us. If we can trust the good news of the gospel, then we can trust Jesus. And if we can trust Jesus, we can trust God. And if we can trust God, we can turn away from the things of the world and turn back to God, to be reconciled to God. Friends, this is the faith that Paul says can save us and give us new life. This is the kind of trust that allows us to open our hearts to God so that we can receive both forgiveness and also the power of the Holy Spirit, which can progressively heal our brokenness, empower us to battle sin daily, and to live a life that is worthy of our calling. 
If we are willing to take sin seriously in our own lives, then God illuminates our mind and puts us in a position to hear this good news and gives us what we need to trust it for our own salvation. Indeed, God creates this faith in us so that we may be faithful to him, so that we can trust him and live according to his will. And it's the living. Are you awake, church? It's in the living, living closely to God by following Jesus daily in the power of the Holy Spirit that we find healing for our broken hearts. It's not a magic trick. It's in the daily living close to God. This is where we find healing for our broken hearts, liberation for our enslaved minds, and transformation of our desire in love. But it all comes down to one question. God asks, do you trust me? Not do you believe in me. Do you trust me? And I want you to really ask yourself that question this morning. Do you trust God? Because if you don't trust God, there's no way that you will ever put God first in your life. You will not put God above your spouse and your kids. You will not put God above money and friendship and all the things that we strive after. You won't do it. So God asks a simple question. Do you trust me? Now, as should be clear by now, the main point of this message is that sin is serious and we are wise to take it seriously, not just in other people, but also in ourselves. But the reason why this is important is because it can lead us to the solution. Does anybody need the solution this morning? The good news of Jesus is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, who has faith, everyone who trusts it, who receives it, and who acts on it. And my prayer this morning is that the Holy Spirit has been working inside of you as we've considered the seriousness of sin, inspiring you to follow Jesus or to get closer to Jesus. Because we need him, friends. We can't do it on our own. And at this point, I want to extend an invitation. If you've never made a serious commitment to follow Jesus, and you wanna do so this morning, in just a few moments, I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you to stand up, to walk to the front, or to do anything weird. (laughs) I'm just gonna invite you to raise your hand. And I wanna say, there is nothing magical about this, and raising your hand is not a precondition for receiving God's forgiveness, but, There is something powerful that happens inside of us when we express an inward commitment outwardly. And raising your hand is a symbolic act of resolute commitment. In addition, I'm going to invite invite anybody who said yes to Jesus a long time ago, but for whatever reason stopped following, I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand too as a way of expressing your resolute commitment to rededicating your life to Christ, to recommitting to your faith. And if you're feeling led to raise your hand, but the minute that I said I was gonna ask, you started getting really anxious and fearful, that's normal. But I promise you, my friends, that you can trust me And you can trust the people in this room to love and support you in this act of commitment. So whether you are a Christian or not, whether you are a praying person or not, whether you are here because you wanted to be here or because your spouse dragged you here, (laughs) I want everyone to close their eyes and bow their head. 
And I want you to do this so that the people around you will feel safe to respond. And with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you would like to say yes to Jesus or recommit your life to Christ, I just want you to raise your hand right now. God sees you, my friend, and you, and you, and you. God sees you, and you, and you, and you, my friend. So many hands have gone up. Is there anyone else in you? Man, this is amazing. This is amazing. Whether you raise your hand or not, I just want to invite you to say this prayer with me this morning. We're all going to say it out loud. God sees you too, friend. Will you pray after me? Gracious God, thank you for loving me and thank you for Jesus. I know I've made mistakes, that I have failed you, failed myself and failed others. Please forgive me of my sins and give me a second chance. Lift the burdens of guilt and shame. Show me where I need to make amends and help me to find my next step in following Jesus. I surrender my life to Christ and commit to following where he leads. Put people in my life that will teach me, guide me, help me, and encourage me. As I follow Jesus, heal my hurts and change my heart so that I can love you and others as you have loved me. I pray these things in Jesus' name, and I trust that you will do for me what I ask in this prayer.